Welcome to the course Environmental Impact Assessment. Today we will cover coastal ecology and geomorphology under the larger ambit of our discussion, law, policy and institutional arrangement which we are going on seeing right now. So, accordingly our coverage would include uh, we will look at the coastal ecology and geomorphology and then we will review the context and which are the authorities which are involved. Further, we will look into the global agreement like the pattern which we are following and then we will look like what are its implication on coastal and marine uh, biodiversity. Further, we will look into the governance policy framework for coastal and marine uh, environments in particular to uh, Indian context. Further, we will look at uh, the uh, policies and guidelines involved. So, the learning outcomes which will be we would expect would be that after completion of this particular session, uh, you should be able to synthesize coastal ecology and geomorphology context and authorities. You should be able to see like what's really happening and then what's the complexity involved and which agencies look into it and how those regulations uh, acts comes in place. Further, you should be able to review the global agreements uh, involved with coastal and marine biodiversity and look at its implications. Further, you should be able to look at the governance and policy framework for coastal and marine biodiversity uh, and protected areas in the context of our country. Further, you should be able to identify policies and guidelines. So, looking at the context and authorities involved in the coastal ecology geomorphology context. We see that uh, if you will uh, recollect in our first week of uh, lectures, we uh, particularly lecture 3 where we reviewed status of global environment uh, focused on oceans and coasts. We discussed the complexity involved in governance of the ocean. So, uh, uh, we discussed about like how oceans currents can carry chemicals, waste, um, emerging organic pollutants and pathogens and they can carry beyond areas under like whatever is national maritime boundaries, it can carry those beyond those uh, boundaries. And uh, so, uh, your area can be influenced by the activities of others or whom you have no control over. And marine organisms and seabirds may not remain under the jurisdiction of a, any state. So, those kind of cons complexities are involved. Further, uh, there are interlinkages between ocean conditions and marine life. So, that is also inter uh, interlinked. And uh, there are like spatial dynamics of ocean process what happens like what we had seen in the diagram that uh, there are a lot of multiple activities and industries involved and which have very far reaching impacts. So, all uh, many such patterns disrupt the livelihoods of the people who probably receive no benefits from the industry that has caused the impact. So, those kind of complexities are there and they become victims of functioning of the other people. So, uh, further we see adding to that there are multiple and often conflicting uses which we had seen here if you recollect the graphics which we had discussed. So, uh, because of these, uh, these complexities which we see here uh, there is no uh, overall authority which is responsible for management of oceans and coastal resources. So, uh, you see like there are a lot of domains here and then uh, there is a lot of complexity here plus you see that uh, there are multiple authorities which are involved. So, responsibilities are shared among several central and local agencies with varying responsibilities and limits of jurisdiction like what would be under whose control. So, uh, for example, you can see here uh, like um, uh, MOEFCC uh, is responsible for management of resources in the coastal areas, coastal water and uh, it is the nodal ministry with major responsibility for protecting marine environment. 
It is also responsible for undertaking all legislative measures, so whatever legislations are prepared, uh, MOEFC is the major authority here. And you also see that uh, you have Department of Ocean Development, which looks into the scientific monitoring of the marine environment, management of resources in the high seas. Um, you would also see Ministry of Agriculture, which is responsible for fisheries, aquaculture, fishing processing. And then you also find Ministry of Water Resource, uh, which is responsible to monitor erosion. Furthermore, you see that uh, you have involvement of Ministry of Defense in the Indian Coast, uh, like Indian Coast Guard, who are responsible for pollution, uh, like take a pollution response measures, including oil pollution. So they are responsible for that. So you see the varied uh, agencies which are involved. So you further see that Ministry of Surface Transport uh, look at the ports and shipping while Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas looks at the offshore installation like what kind of installations would happen with infrastructure uh, then also the co coastal refineries pipelines and other infrastructure would which would come up then uh, you see involvement of tourism ministry for tourism related activities in the coastal region furthermore you find ministry of mines for mining activities in the coastal region so you see uh, the level of complexity involved and um, think of eie procedure and the references you might have to take in the process for legislative understanding of any proposed project so uh, looking at the global agreements uh, related with coastal and marine uh, biodiversity, so you see that uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, which we have seen in other topic as well, uh, we, we have, uh, there are a lot of things which align with that. Uh, then we have Convention on Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals, since uh, well, like marine would be dealing with that, coastal areas would be dealing with that, and um, we also see um, uh, like, this is also called as a bond convention. Then uh, you have convention on international trade in endangered species of wild fauna and flora uh, like sites. Uh, so uh, this also applies and then you also see international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture. Then you see Ramsar Convention or the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance. Then we also have World Heritage Convention. Then you also have UNFCC. Then you have United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, HIGO and Senegal Framework for Actions Related with Disaster Risk Management. And then you also see United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, which we had seen, uh, agreement on um, straddling fish stock and highly migratory fish stocks. And then you also see London Convention or Convention on Prevention of Marine Pollution by Dumping of Waste and Other Matters. Uh, you also uh, see the Basel Convention, then you also see um, FAO code of conduct for responsible fisheries, then also international principles for responsible shrimp farming and international convention for the regulation of whaling. And then you also see international convention for the prevention of pollutions from ships, MARPOL. So all these uh, international agreements and um, uh, legislations which you see are there for the coastal zones. So you may see here that much of the international legislation agreements provided here are both inland and coastal waters. So you see that how uh, you might have to expand to the other inland areas as well. Many of the legislations are not specific to the coast but are highly relevant to the coastal zone. So therefore, many of them would apply to the coastal zone also when you are doing your EIA here. So, uh, uh, for example, we see that EU meets its obligation for uh, like how do they really uh, apply these or integrate these things. So, uh, EU, uh, European U Union meets uh, its obligations for bird species under the Bonn Convention and more generally the Bonn Convention by 
means of birds directives. So, they have a birds directives uh, which is uh, then uh, like uh, translated into legislation of individual member states. So, individual me member states. So, as per the convention, the birds directive is prepared and on the basis of birds directive, uh, all, all the member states uh, prepare their own legislation. So, you see how it translates. Further, we see that um, uh, similarly on this ground, you, similarly on this principle, you see ESPO convention. Uh, uh, we have seen this uh, before. Uh, ESPO convention on environmental impact assessments in transboundary context. So, when there are more than one um, a nation involves, uh, then uh, in the con that context, uh, this ESPO convention comes into place. And uh, that also sets obligations of the parties uh, like to assess the environmental impact of certain activities at uh, early stage of the planning process. So, um, you know, that also is translated into local uh, legislation. Uh, however, we are not uh, part of this as, as a country. Uh, there are 30 signatories which are there and then mostly it is EU countries and North American countries. So, as per the uh, ESPO convention, you see that uh, uh, EIA process is again uh, aligned with it. For uh, example, you can see the directive um, 97 of environmental clearance, you see uh, it uh, brought EIA practice in line with the convention. So, this particular directive aligned their practice uh, with the convention and uh, based on that see how it is also influencing the process which is adopted. So, it, it increased the type of projects covered. So, uh, you, you, we had uh, seen very briefly like how we do screening. So, uh, in that screening uh, what projects would come and what would not come. So, because of this particular convention the types of projects covered would also increase or uh, would be added to the list and the number of projects requiring uh, mandatory EIA. And uh, uh, here if through this uh, directive uh, example you can see that um, um, in the directive projects like uh, crude oil refinery, thermal power station, nuclear fuel, um, uh, major installations, constructions and so on are added to the list of activities which need to be considered under EIA. So, as per the convention, the list is refined and amended uh, in the process. So, that is how it impacts any country's EIA process. So, because of these agreements, countries often set new screening arrangements also. So, including new sc uh, screening criteria. So, uh, they would also have new screening criteria. and. Uh, also establish minimum information requirements. So, here you can see uh, in this like uh, what, what how they are going to look at the agriculture, uh, selviculture and aquaculture, uh, e extraction of uh, extraction industry. So, you can see it in the annexure 2. Likewise, you can see in annexure 3 what will be the selection criteria which will be imposed. So, characteristic of a project which kind of projects would be included, locations of the projects and so on. So, you also saw that how it was also implicating in our cases uh, as per the list and special consideration for specific areas. So, uh, uh, therefore, amendments are made. So, based on these conventions, amendments are made in the EIA process all, uh, also. In the context of UK, you will find amendments in the town and country planning, EIA regulation 2011. You would also see changes in marine works uh, regulation 2007 as well as infrastructure planning regulation 2009. So, all, all are aligned with environmental impact assessment process. So, uh, uh, we, we see that uh, um, there are uh, many um, umbrella international directives uh, such as uh, you also see uh, at, at, uh, at the international level you can find water framework directive uh, which is European uh, countries need to follow. So, the requirements of water framework directive 
uh, need to be considered during all stages of planning and development process. So, uh, this requires the uh, EU member states uh, to uh, prevent uh, like this is really done to prevent deterioration and to protect and enhance the status of aquatic ecosystems. So, water framework directives are taken as a blanket uh, uh, directive and based on that uh, all the member states have to take actions uh, aligned with that. So, they need to ensure all the new schemes do not have any negative impact on the aquatic ecosystem and uh, uh, I have also given you the link here to the directive. So, you can see all the general information given on the right hand side in the water framework directive like uh, what is it about, what would be the decision making process and timetable and then the links to that and all the legislation involved including groundwater and also surface water chemical pollution. So, uh, you, you would see that uh, WFD requires all inland estuaries and coastal waters to reach good status by uh, 2021 if not then by 2026. So, there is a timeline, there is a target which is aligned and uh, they approach good status by creating river basin district structure. Uh, in these river basin district require, they, re they are required uh, to align the environmental objectives, they have to set this to have those ecological targets in place. So, uh, similarly you see directive 2008 uh, that is the waste framework directive and that uh, the purpose of this directive is to control pollution of all surface water including coastal waters and cover some uh, port and harbor operation and this is aligned with the EIA process. So, uh, uh, looking at Europe you would also find uh, that uh, we have uh, marine strategy framework directive uh, which aims to protect uh, more effectively the marine ac environment across Europe by achieving good environmental status. So, uh, it looks uh, and uh, they have certain time period and targets set. Uh, uh, this is the first, uh, it is said to be the first uh, EU legislative instrument related to the protection of marine biodiversity and uh, it contains explicit like regulatory objective, uh, very defined one that biodiversity has to be maintained by a particular time period and uh, what kind of achievements they need to make in terms of environmental status. So, in the image you can see. Uh, in the image you can see the steps to achieve or maintain good environmental status, the marine strategy framework directive management cycle and uh, here you can see in the blue circle which represents the different elements that may be included in the marine strategies and uh, small orange circles represent the timeline to include the elements. So, by when, what, how they have to attain the target and uh, uh, this helps to translate the global targets into national and local policies and then to achieve that. So, aligned with the global agreement as well as national governance and resource management, uh, we find following governance structure and policy framework for coastal and marine biodiversity and protected area and specifically in our country we will be looking at and uh, aligned with it you would see range of laws you need to refer or and abide by. In the image you can see coastal regulation zone notification forest conservation act. And aligned with it you would uh, see range of laws you need to refer and abide by. In the image you can see coastal regulation zone notification, you can also see forest conservation act, water prevention and control of pollution act, hazardous waste management act, EIA notification, environmental protection act, in, uh, wildlife protection act and biological diversity act. So, uh, you also see deep sea fishing policy, Indian Fisheries Act and Marine Fishery Regulation Act under the Ministry of Agriculture. So, you will find Indian uh, Ports Act, Major Port a Trust Act and Merchant Shipping Act under Defence, Coast Guard Act and Marine Time Zone Act under Ministry of Shipping. So, now looking uh, at the Indian Coastal Regulation Zone, so we will just briefly touch upon that. So, uh, 
protected areas are only uh, one aspect of protection of coastal and marine ecosystem. So there are other ways of conserving coastal and marine biodiversity under the ecosystem approach such as regulating the activities in coastal and marine ecosystems. So a lot, a lot of activities are controlled uh, mere than just protecting it. Uh, so the main instrument uh, regarding this is the, uh, especially in the Indian context, is the CRZ uh, notification under the Environmental Protection Act. So uh, the, uh, the other significant aspect is the restriction on fishing along the coastal areas. So uh, you may refer to CRZ notification 2011 and 2018. Uh, looking at the main purpose of this, wh why CRZ notification is creating, uh, created, so it is created to ensure livelihood security to the fishing communities and other local communities living in the coastal areas. So we did talk about our context and authority, like how one activity impacts the live, uh, others uh, life and um, access to resources. So here you see that uh, this particular CRZ notification ensures livelihood security. The other it looks into conserve and protect co coastal stretches like how the protection could be done and then promote development in sustainable manner. So whatever development happens, it happens in a sustainable manner based on scientific principles taking into account the dangers of natural hazards in coastal areas and sea level rise due to the global warming. So we talked about all these things. So CRZ notification ensures that that's translated on the ground and uh, as a rule it comes and it's implemented. So uh, in the CRZ you would see that there are general prohibition rules uh, so the, it, uh, I'll, uh, it prohibits certain kinds of activity uh, and uh, especially prohibits the setting of new industries, expansion of the existing industries. And uh, however, it's not an absolute uh, 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 prohibition. There can be uh, some uh, activities which are uh, allowed in CRZ. These include like uh, uh, Department of Atomic Energy, power generation by non-conventional energy sources and so on. So you can see, look into the details. And then uh, there are certain things which uh, are uh, regulated uh, for the environmental clearance purpose. Furthermore, you see that uh, it's, uh, in this you are required to prepare a coastal zone management plan. So uh, all these identified areas are supposed to, within this uh, notification, they are supposed to prepare a coastal zone management plan where uh, they would provide all the coastal um, uh, related what kind of development activities they are taking and uh, how, how they plan to protect the area and then improve the condition of this particular area. So uh, this you see under the uh, CRZ notification and as per the notification you can see that uh, they have identified uh, CRZ 1, 2, 3 and 4. Uh, if you look at it, C, uh, CRZ1 areas are environmentally most critical and are further classified as A and B. So you would see that uh, CRZ8 uh, would be the um, ecologically sensitive area, ESA. And the geomorphological features which would play a role in maintaining the integrity of the coast. So all those kind of areas would fall under CRZ1. Uh, a and then you would see CRZ1B uh, which is like the intertidal zone that is the area between low tide line and the high tide line. Uh, this would constitute the CRZ1B. Likewise you can see CRZ2 which would be the developed land area up to the close to the shoreline uh, and uh, within the existing municipal limits or in other existing legally designated, either it is a municipal limit or it is any other designation which is given there. So uh, uh, the, that area would be included under CRZ2. Then you have CRZ3 that includes the land area that are relatively undisturbed. So that would come under CRZ2, uh, CRZ3. Then you see CRZ3A, uh, the subdivision, which are like densely populated areas where the population density is more than like uh, 2000 
plus per square kilometer as per 2011 census. So, uh, that would be under CRZA then um, and uh, area up to 50 meters from a high tide line on the uh, landward side shall be uh, like uh, usually uh, it is uh, marked as no development zone which is like NDZ. So, uh, they uh, provide the coast uh, and uh, they are also required to provide the coastal zone management plan as per the notification and, uh, and it has to be undertaken with the uh, due consultative process uh, and uh, if, if any kind of development comes in these areas. Further, you see that there is CRZ3B and uh, that uh, uh, you, you see that uh, uh, wherever you have population density less than um, 2161 per square kilometer as specified um, uh, according to the census of 2011 uh, shall be designated as CRZB. And, uh, there's are, there are buffer range which are given again uh, which would be considered as no development zone. So, likewise you see CRZ4 then with that are also subdivided as A and B and CRZ4 uh, is uh, uh, the water area and uh, within that water area uh, the seabed area between low tide and um, and up to like 12 nautical miles of seaward side is constitute 4A. Likewise, you can see area of uh, water area uh, and uh, the bed area between low tide and the bank of the tidal influence water body is considered as 4B. So, that is for your understanding like how the, these areas are divided. So, uh, that was about the CRZ Act. Now, moving on, we look at the Environmental Protection Act 1986 in the context of uh, marine protection areas. So, uh, EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Act 1986, uh, which is an umbrella legislation for protection of the environment, that uh, within that uh, we identify these MPAs and these provisions are made. So, within that everything is worked and they are the ones who make the laws. Then you also see the Biological Diversity Act and uh, uh, 2002 and this also addresses uh, the um, um, MPAs here. So, this act contains provision uh, which uh, uh, aims at preservation of the biological diversity in India and establish a mechanism for equitable sharing of benefits arising out of use of traditional biological resources and knowledge. So, here you see through this how the sharing of the resources happen. So, that also you can see here as per the government notification. So, uh, you also look at the Scheduled Tribes and Other Traditional Forest Dwellers Act 2006 in this context of uh, MPAs. So, uh, this one provides for a framework for uh, recording forest rights and it uh, recogn uh, this act recognized rights under the act uh, including responsibility and authority for sustainable use. So, they have the responsibility as well as conservation of biodiversity and maintenance of ecological balance and thereby strengthening the conservation regime of forest while ensuring livelihood and food security for this. And uh, this forest right include the community rights of uh, use or entitlements of natural pr uh, products such as fish. So, that would be your uh, concern while preparing the EIA. Uh, and then the rules under the act make provision for inclusion of traditional fishing grounds as evidence for determination of forest rights. These could be of importance to fishing communities living in the uh, like uh, for example, you can see Sundarbans Tiger uh, Reserve area in West Bengal. So, all, all those have been identified and then they one while preparing should look into that. And then you also have wetlands conservation management uh, rule or uh, rules of 2010. So, you can look into the wetlands, what does the wetland mean? So, wetland uh, means an area of marsh, peatland and water. So, all these are identified and, uh, uh, and these are the areas where the water level remains near or above the surface of the ground for most of the year. And so, there is a lot of uh, significance which is given to its function 
and importance now. So, the, there is a lot of protection which we are being done. So, uh, regarding that, uh, we have national wetland conservation programs which protected. So, the government of India has been implementing the national wetland conservation program. Um, uh, like in, uh, it does it in the collaboration with the state government and uh, uh, state government and union territories. And uh, under this program, there has been how 100 plus wetlands have been identified till now by the ministry, uh, which require like urgent conservation and management intervention. So, you, you can see uh, the entire map here. So, um, um, moving forward, we see another act for a concern, which is like Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Uh, this also has implication on the uh, marine protected areas. So, uh, looking at uh, like uh, what is marine protected areas, they are the protected areas of seas and ocean that typically restrict human activities to protect natural or cultural resources. So, as per the Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun, you see the marine protected area is essentially a space in the ocean where human activities are more strictly regulated. So, there, there's a very protected area, we cannot really do everything what, uh, there are restrictions on what uh, can be done in these areas. For example, you can see Pulikat Lake in Andhra Pradesh, then you can also see uh, Campbell Bay and uh, Andaman and Nicobar Island. So, which are all classified as marine uh, protected areas. So, uh, you, you can see the activities permissible under various conservation levels for marine protected areas. Uh, you can see range of activities from research, traditional use, fishing, harbors, uh, ports and permissions in national parks, sanctuary, community reserves, conservation. And most stringent you can see is the national park. So, you, you will look into definitions of national park, sanctuary, community reserve in the later part of the lecture. So, you see all range of activities which are allowed uh, activities like uh, research, non-extractive, traditional use, non-extractive, recreational, shipping, traditional fishing, untreated waste discharge, fishing co collection, harbor, mining, renewal and you see like how uh, across the national park, sanctuary, community reserve, conservation reserve, uh, w what all kind of activities are allowed and not allowed. So, looking at all these uh, protected areas, the largest MPAs are in India and Pacific Oceans. Uh, in 2014, uh, more than 6,500 MPAs encompass just over 2 percent of the world's ocean. So, uh, we have numbers of number of them here. And uh, there are uh, a number of voluntary marine nature reserves have been also established by agreements between non-governmental organization, stakeholders and user groups and coastal sites uh, and uh, uh, may have national designations and non-statutory non designations also. So, you might have these as well. Then uh, we also see a special area of conservation that is SAC. Uh, and you also see special protection areas uh, or the Ramsar sites. So, uh, a, a lot of protection is provided to this as well and they are at the international level. So, Ramsar convention uh, which is also the convention on wetlands for international importance uh, they uh, and especially for the uh, wetland habitat. Uh, uh, for uh, within that uh, we identify a lot of areas. And presently, there are 169 contracting parties to this. So, uh, R Ramsar's definitions of wetland uh, considerably it is wide, so it includes lots of lot of areas. So, uh, like it includes areas of marine water depth of which uh, low tide does not exceed 6 meters as well as fish ponds, rice paddies and salt pans. So, uh, in EU, we see many Ramsar sites are also SPAs uh, classified under the BIRDS directive. And uh, however, despite all these kind of initiatives, it is still reported that there is uh, significant development pressures on these areas. So, uh, now uh, looking at uh, the Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972. 
uh, uh, this uh, came uh, with the need to protect marine flora and fauna and this specially recognized and reflected uh, the um, purpose of uh, protecting the wildlife. So, uh, here you see uh, this one particularly introduced the definition of protected areas uh, and uh, uh, with inclusions of certain sections. And under this, uh, if you look at uh, the definition of protected areas, uh, uh, they, they also created national park. Uh, here they created sanctuary, then the conservation reserve or the community reserve uh, that all were uh, identified for the purpose of protection. So, if you, if you look at uh, their um, 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 terms, how they are def uh, defined, so there are uh, the sanctuaries are the areas of adequate ecological uh, fauna and floral uh, geomorphological, natural or geological significance and um, um, wherever such areas are found, they can be declared as sanctuaries for the purpose of protecting, also propagating or developing wildlife or its environment. So, uh, sanctuaries can uh, be declared, uh, this can be declared by the state government or the central government. Uh, they both uh, can declare any, any area which, is, uh, which may fall under this category as uh, sanctuaries. So, for example, you can see here Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, here you can uh, see uh, this has been identified. Looking at national park, uh, the, these are also uh, protected areas. So, national parks are the areas of ecological uh, fauna and floral geomorphological or geological association or importance. So, they are uh, also identified uh, within this and then the national uh, uh, within this uh, if it is uh, identified for the purpose of protecting, propagating and developing wildlife and its in environment. So, uh, the state government and the central government, any of them can declare that as a national park. So, the example would include, uh, so the example if you see here is, I have just picked up one, you have a list of these uh, pa national parks. So, the Kaziranga National Park Assam, you can see here from the country. So, uh, uh, looking at conservation reserves, so the cons, uh, like uh, paying attention to the concept of conservation reserve. So, conservation reserve con, uh, is like um, uh, and uh, you also have community reserve. Uh, these concepts were introduced uh, through the amendment of Wildlife Protection Act in 2003. So, both of these aimed at uh, like uh, improving the socio-economic condition of people as well as conservation of the wildlife. So, looking at both the aspect not only protecting the wildlife, but also taking care of the people. So, conservation reserves uh, are areas which are owned by the state government and are adjacent to or linked to the protected areas. So, these are the surrounding areas. So, anything adjoining to the protected areas would fall under the conservation reserve or the community reserve area. So, the uh, uh, again the power of notifying this uh, is with the state governments uh, and they can notify this area. And uh, the example of this includes Shokar Ladakh, uh, you can see here, uh, which is as a conservation reserve site identified. And then you also see the efforts at uh, international level to bring responsibility under one umbrella. So, uh, you, you saw that we have a lot of complexity in terms of there are a lot of numerous authorities, there are a lot of numerous uh, uh, acts as well as responsibilities and then there are conflict, uh, conflicting uses and requirements. But then there is effort uh, being made to bring everything under international, uh, like uh, at the international level, uh, there are efforts to bring uh, all these things under one umbrella. So, for example, we can see it in UK, uh, there is a marine management uh, organization, MMO, which was established under the Marine and Coastal Access Act 2009. So, this is an umbrella organization with overall responsibility. So, it looks after everything from licensing, regulating and uh, planning marine activities in the seas uh, around uh, the England and Wales. So, uh, uh, they have, uh, they are overall in charge of this. So, you can see here.
So, uh, now um, moving at the policies and guidance. So, we, we see that uh, European countries made provision for carrying capacity. So, now how, how uh, uh, with any act, any provision, they are also supporting it with policy and guidance. So, uh, how people will really execute it. So, we see that European countries made provision for carrying capacity of coastal environment. Uh, to, to align with the sustainable development goals. So, for that uh, there was requirement to uh, uh, assess and uh, undertake carrying capacity studies and align them with the goals. So, anything beyond those carrying capacity uh, would not be acceptable. Plus, there were made provision for integrated coastal zone management ICZM which was uh, many of the countries undertook that in the uh, integrated coastal zone management to align their interventions uh, with the uh, Rio Earth Summit and also with World Coastal Conference. So, uh, uh, so this has led to uh, focus like because of this integrated and then carrying capacity has led to improved and integrated coastal management in order to deal with the uh, complexity here. So, uh, we also see that we have UK shoreline management plans uh, where um, oh, and uh, we also see we also see countries have UK shoreline management plan, we also see estuaries management plan, coastal habitat management plan. So, all these kind of management plans are coming which guide uh, the uh, development in the area. So, how we based on these plans the development regular development would be executed in those uh, areas. So, the link is provided for the reference if you would like to see that in detail. So, there are also initiatives uh, for flood and coastal defense work. So, uh, they are majorly done for conserving key coastal areas including na nature conservation interest areas of uh, SACs, SPAs and Ramsar sites. So, this is particularly important where current defense line uh, are very weak. So, they cannot really protect. So, then these kind of areas uh, protect those uh, coastal areas. So, uh, we see there are other kind of interventions also like European Union also uh, initiated the framework for maritime spatial planning and integrated coastal management. So, uh, like the spatial plans are prepared and then uh, guidelines are also given for integrated coastal management plan. And uh, this, uh, this is said to be an instrument uh, which has to be adopted by the other member states. And uh, in uh, integrated coastal management, uh, this allows the coverage of entire like uh, allows uh, information collection, how the planning has to be done, how this decision making has to be done and how management and monitoring has to be uh, undertaken. It all provides all kind of guidelines here. So, uh, this was what we saw today. So, summarizing our coverage, we saw coastal ecological and geomorphological context and the authorities and how uh, what kind of pro problems are there. Then we reviewed global agreement, coastal and marine biodiversity and its implication. Then we also looked at uh, policy framework for coastal marine biodiversity and protected areas. and. Uh, as well as we looked at the policies and some of the guidelines which are available at the international level. So, that was the coverage for today. Uh, these are, were our key references which we had used uh, for this particular uh, session. So, these are the suggested watch and read. Uh, our coverage is very limited in terms of what we can cover. So, a lot of acts and other things we have mentioned, but not covered in detail. So, you can also look for, uh, at some of the uh, uh, detail uh, reviews and other things which have been given to you. So, please uh, winding up here, please feel free to ask questions, let us know about any concerns you have. Do share your opinion, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring EIA. Thank you.